Hi, and welcome back to another episode of JPlay. I'm Marcus, and today I will be doing another review rule explanation video about Cornish Smuggler here. This is the Kickstarter version of the game, and this comes for once with this awesome little soundtrack which I really like a lot. And these cool wooden ship miniatures. And during the campaign there were also additional uh, stretch goals that have been achieved, like some additional ship cards and loads of additional secrets cards. Some of the secret cards seem to be a little bit overpowered. Uh, this is from my experience and also from the, some of the forums you can find at BoardGameGeek. And I really am tending to thinning out the secret stack a little bit, so really um, getting some of the cards out of there. I won't tell you which ones, um, maybe you really have to um, encounter that on your own. Maybe I'm just playing it wrong, maybe you really have to play this game more often to get behind all the strategic decisions, but that's how I feel. Uh, additionally, um, this Kickstarter version comes with a rules addendum sheet that takes care about the broken rules in respect to the honest work where you could easily um, do honest work for the very first round of the game and then everyone would buy their secret cards and the deck would be empty and everyone would um, have too many cards on his hand. So this is definitely something that has to take place. Apart from all these, yeah, let's say, additions and remarks in respect to the secret cards, I really think this is a great game. I absolutely like the artwork and the scene to that. Also, the, the game mechanic itself is, is really pretty slick and, and brings a lot of fun. And I think really with some, or maybe one or two house rules or variants, or more, maybe even with the rules version 2, this has definitely the potential to be a very great game. So, as usual, I will have a look inside the box. I show you some of the components and then I think I get started and more or less explain you most of the rules, maybe not 100% of them because this is a little bit uh, too much for, for just one video. Uh, but I really try to teach you the core mechanics of the game and the most important um, yeah, things you can do in Cornish Smuggler. Now, let's get started! I think I can show you most of the components while doing the setup of this game, so just let's get started. First of all, you give the secrets cards a good shuffle and then you put that on the appropriate space on the field here. I think I already showed you the secrets card during my introduction, so we can directly jump into the customs warehouse and you put one of these black fellas once on the starting space here on this wheel and then one on this thick bordered spaces that are shown here in the customs warehouse. So there's one at 2, 6, uh, 9, 12, 15 and 18. Then you separate the character cards into their appropriate types. So for example, efficient or unskilled here, you give each of the part a good shuffle and place them on the board uh, on their according spaces. So the official on the official spaces, but for now you keep them face down. Then you put one customs officers here in pensions and one to St. Ives. And then you put the good shapes into the porting positions on the merchant spaces here. Though this is a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle, Tetris style kind of stuff, so you see they're all rounded thick, so basically every good shape has its dedicated space on any merchant space. Each player starts the game with 13 gold, 10 of these influence markers, a set of these uh, bribe tokens or bribe rings here that are required to bribe customs officers. They get a set of these network counters here and of course the ship. This would be the normal ship or the, the ship from the normal edition and in comparison this is the nice wooden ship that comes with the Kickstarter version. The last player who smuggled something, not to say that anyone would admit that, gets the starting player token. The starting player gets to choose his ship first, so he takes this pile of 10 different ship cards here and chooses one and gives the other or the remaining 9 ships to the player to his left who would also select a ship. And these ships are pretty different in respect to storage they have. They are all the same in respect to speed and stuff like that, but all the ships can hold different kinds of goods. And to keep it fair, the last player can choose the warehouse first. So these are the five starting warehouses. There are also different warehouses in play that have, instead of start, a special text written to that. And these come with characters that you can acquire during the game. 
Again, the first player can choose his starting characters first and he, he would draw two cards from two different decks that's important so for example he could go for official guy and a religious guy and from these two he can choose one to keep as a general hint for this game characters with a higher reputation are the better fit when starting off this game because this reputation later on generates for one victory points but i explain that in a second but they also create this influence cube at the start of each round the character that has not been chosen will be put under the deck that corresponds to him so he will or she will come out sooner or later in this game. When choosing the starting character for beginning the game you don't have to pay the cost for the um, that's printed on the card here but as well you also don't get um, during the very first round the influence cubes that come with the reputation of that. When you select your starting character, you're also allowed to take your starting reputation that matches the reputation on this card. So this is some kind of first set of victory points, basically. Then each player puts a, one of his network counters into one space. It should be mentioned that you are only able to land goods to the coast when you have a network counter at a harbor where you are able to land any goods here. So it wouldn't hurt to start off uh, in a location like this. Or maybe here. It's also important to mention that different network counters can share a space easily. Again starting with a starting player each player puts his ship counter on either merchant space or any sea space but to be honest I found it pretty useful to start your very first turn at one of these merchant spaces here. And as a very, very, very last action, you flip over the top cards of each of these character decks. So these are now the characters that are available for a hiring action. And then you are able to start the game. Now let me explain what this game is all about. I think from all the explanations so far you might have read and so on, this game is about smuggling and it's about smuggling in Cornwall. The player who ends this game with a combination of most gold and or reputation is the most famous smuggler and wins this game. It has to be mentioned that all of these victory points that you see here, so these reputation counters and or the gold items are all some kind of a currency in this game. So you are tempted to lose some of your victory points during the game in order to get more actions or to prepare the overall strategy for your game. So you won't ever keep the same amount of of that and so this is definitely something that's relatively unique to this game as far as I can tell. When does the game end? For once when this customs officer reaches all the way up to space number 19 then this is definitely the final round. And the second ending condition would be if the last good shape would be bought from all of the merchants that are on the board. If ever one of these events does happen during the game then the last round would start so all the players can take their remaining actions based on influence cubes and whatsoever and after everyone would have passed then the game would end. Let's have a look at some of the possible actions that you can take during this game. Most of the actions are being paid by either paying an influence cube or maybe several influence cubes and or some of these yeah, gold coins in order to activate. For example, if you want to move your ship, then you would have to pay one influence cube or you could pay three gold. But the first thing you normally would do during your very first round would be to acquire some good from the merchant. So in this case you can check the reference card here. So in order to buy one good shape, this is one action basically, you have to pay for once one influence cube that's written here on this card. So let's pay that for the blue player. And then you pay one gold coin for each of the squares on one of these goods. So if you want to go for this good shape here, you also would need to pay three gold coins. Then you could load this shape on any matching location on your ship. For example like here these areas are not allowed to be filled with any good shapes. After taking an action the next player would take an action as well and so on. Then it would be again the turn of the blue player and I already explained that to you. In order to move one C space you would have to pay either one influence or three gold. So in this case we would pay one influence cubes and then we would be allowed to move the blue player ship one space ahead. 
Your target would be to move your ship with or carrying your good shape you just acquired to a harbor where you are allowed to offload your cargo or your contraband. And you're only allowed to do that in a harbor where you have a network counter in place. So you could not sail here to Senan because you don't have a network counter here. In this case, the blue player could either go to St. Levin and try to offload the contraband there or he could hire a character in order to get an additional network counter. So in this case, let's say he wanted to put a network counter into Senan for example, then he would have to pay again either one influence cube or one directly reputation and then he would also have to pay the cost that are printed on the character he's about to hire so let's just assume he wanted to hire Tom here the sea pastor he would also need to pay three gold then he can directly gain this character the next one is flipped over immediately each time you acquire a character you gain immediately the reputation that are printed on the card here as well. So in this case the blue player would gain an additional two reputation points and then he has to play a network counter on the game board. Note when placing your very first network counter during the setup you can place this network counter basically anywhere you want but for anything that you acquire after the setup you have to do that in a network kind of fashion so the next network counter need to be adjacent to any network counters on your game board. So in this case he could either bring a network counter here to St. Berian or here to Senan in order to give an additional offload location. Of course, in this case, you would go for St. Berian because this would be a city where you are allowed to sell your contraband. Let's just assume that during a later turn, the blue player has made it to St. Leven here and then he wanted to offload his contraband to St. Leven. Again, he would need to pay one influence cube and then the landing risk is being calculated and for once the landing risk consists of the amount of contraband you're going to offload there so in this case he wanted to offload this three piece here and also you take into the consideration of the core landing risk of each of these harbors so for example here in St. Levin that's a plus three then you add up all these modifiers together so that's three plus three then you compare it to the current discovery level which is at during the starting turn uh, at nine and if your landing risk is ever higher than the current discovery level then the customs officers would move toward your location in this case we had a landing risk of six but the discovery level is at nine so there is no movement Let's just assume that the blue player offloaded a different set of goods. So for example, this five piece here and the three piece here, this would be already a landing risk of eight. You would add the modifier from St. Leven, which is three, and this would bring you to an 11 in total. And let's further assume that the discovery level is already lowered to seven. So in this case, the nearest customs officers would move four spaces towards St. Leven at this point in time. So let's have a look again. So he, blue player, offloaded these two good shapes here at St. Leven. We already know that we have a plus four movement for these customs officers. And then the nearest customs officers would move towards St. Leven. In this case, here this guy at St. Just would move one, two spaces to St. Leven. And there are still two more points left. So Additionally, another set or another customs officer would move closer to St. Levin. So for example, in this case, this guy would also move the remaining two spaces, so one, two, ahead closer to St. Levin. Now, when the customs officer ever makes it to a space that contains a contraband like this one and he don't have to end it, it would be enough to just move through, then this cust uh, contraband would be uh, confiscated and would be brought to the customs warehouse. Nevertheless, the player could now spend influence cubes in order to reduce the landing risk. So in this case, we know that these, this guy would move to St. Levin and confiscate. So in this case, the blue player could decide to lower the landing risk by three so that the customs officer would only move one space ahead. So he could pay now three influence cubes in order to reduce the landing risk by one. In this case, this um, customs officer would move only one space ahead to Senan. Again, let's make the assumption everything went well, so the contraband has been successfully unloaded to St. Leven. Unfortunately, 
he cannot sell the contraband here because it's basically a village and uh, the village is not able to buy this kind of contraband. You can only buy these goods in a city that show a number in it, like St. Barian over here. During his next turn, the blue player could decide now to move his contraband to St. Barian in order to sell it there in the next turn then afterwards. In order to move your contraband, you have to pay again one influence cube or you could also pay two gold coins that's basically your choice it's printed here on the reference card and then you can move your network counter within your network so you have to have a contact here in St. Burian. Alternatively there is I think this option here move one good shapes and one network counter one space so you could move then for example if he wouldn't have this guy over here he could move both of these to St. Barian, so this is now a legal move, but this costs you three influence or five gold, though this is pretty expensive, so you should really prepare your network accordingly. And then, again, one turn later, Blue Player could now sell this Good Shapes here. And the good thing about selling Good Shapes, it's basically for free if you only want to have, let's say, a relatively reduced price. Let's see how selling actually works. For once you have to see in which town size you are. So for example, you would take the reference card and see, hey, this is town size three, like St. Barian here. And then you see what good size you can sell here. So that's basically a good size of two or three. You can theoretically also sell a good size that's bigger than the three, but then you would lose the external amount of that. So that's basically something you should try to avoid wherever you can. Now let's see how you can define the price for selling your goods there. You could decide to sell at the very first row here where it says no cost. Then you would say, okay, I would say I take the three gold here. In this case, I would gain three gold and two reputation. That's fine, but we can do better. You could also decide to pay one influence or one of these um, reputation cubes in order to go to the second row. In this case, you would gain six gold and one reputation when selling there. That's definitely better. But you could also say, I want to sell down here. And the last row, in this case, you would need to pay two influence or two of these reputation cubes. In this case, you would gain 12 golds, but zero reputation. Let's assume we decided to go with the second row here. So we paid one influence cube. So we would gain six gold directly and one reputation, which we can directly take onto our player area. The next thing is that happens. The closest customs officers would move one space towards the uh, area where we are going to sell this contraband here. So for example, the customs officer in Penzance here would move to San Crete. Additionally, the gold wheel will be turned and this goes clockwise according to the amount of gold that just been earned. So in this case, this was six gold. So this one, two, three, four, five and six. Whenever this counter reaches the start uh, space here, this stone would advance one step ahead. This can very easily be that you sell, for example, gold worth of 15 gold. In this case, maybe the start button or the start space is hit several times. In this case, really, this stone is moved several times. So it can easily be that during your very first sell action, you would land maybe here in a new discovery level. And this also means then whenever you reach one of these thick areas here that this customs officer can be placed to any space that does not count contain a network counter or any good on the game board. And this is placed by the player with the least gold. As a small reward for the other players, all other players are now allowed to draw one secret card for the good shape that's being sold here. And now it's a good time to have a look at these secret cards here. Some of these secret cards are played as an action, so you have to lose one action or to have, yeah, basically lose your action in order to play this card here. So in this case, it says move any three network counters one space. These network counters can belong to any player. Can be pretty nasty, but they are also reaction cards in play. So they say play at any time. So you, you boy card says pay two influence when a customs officer is being moved and then you are deciding where this customs officer moves. Most of these cards, or I think, 
I think m yeah, most of these cards are directly discarded after the usage. After selling a goods token here, this is completely removed from the game. An additional possibility to play in action is to motivate a character that you control. So for example, Richard Blacklock here, the loafer, it says motivate is action. As an action motivate is, yeah, more or less you tap it and then you activate him. In this case, you pay three influence to move any of your goods to spaces. You don't need to network counter at the destination. This can be pretty nice, but most of this character can only be used once during a round. Some of these character cards bring you uh, an additional storehouse. So for example, if you ever hire Henry Baker, Mayor of Penzance, you receive the Mayor's Wine Cellar Storehouse, which would be this storehouse here. You see that's a special storehouse. The storehouse is in Penzance. And the good thing about these storehouses is that anything you would offload into Penzance here would directly go into your secret storehouse and is really safe from the customs. So if the customs ever makes it here to Penzance, all the goods that are currently in your wine cellar here are safe. But sooner or later you want to maybe move these goods maybe to another city. In this case you would have to get rid of this customs officer here by either moving him or by bribing the customs officer. Again, this you take an action. You have to have a network counter at the location where you try to bribe the customs officer. Then you pay one influence cube and then you pay the according gold cost and the gold cost increase during the game so you start with a bright cost of five here as soon as the turn track is still here but later on you see the bright cost goes higher and higher up to 13 here when you bribe the customs officers, you put this little rubber ring ab around him here so you, everyone sees, okay, this guy is bribed. And a customs officer can only be bribed by one player at a time. So for example, if the red player wants to bribe the same customs officer at a later time, then he still has to pay the bribe costs that are actual. And he also needs to pay one additional gold because this guy is already bribed. So, and then afterwards when he bribes and then he replaces the blue ring with a red ring. Ring. As soon as a customs officer is bribed by you, he will never ever seize one contraband from you. Of course, this doesn't keep a next customs officer that will show up in Pensans here to confiscate your contraband instead of him. I already mentioned it briefly, everything that's been seized by the customs and in the customs warehouse here at the top of the game board. And you can try to raid the customs warehouse as one of your action. In this case, you always have to pay one influence cube and the player trying to raid the customs warehouse needs to have at least two of the contacts here that show this little mob symbol here. Now, when he wants to, to try to raid the warehouse, then he has to give back one of these mobs. So it needs really to be discarded. So for example, the maybe the gentleman of Senna here. So he has to give back this contact card. He also would lose the two uh, reputation that are printed on this card. So this is really something you have to consider. And you also lose one network counter that is uh, more or less in relation to this card. Of course, you don't have to remember which network counter you played for which character. You only have to reduce or remove one network counter from your network. Then you can choose one of the cast or these good tokens that are in the custom warehouse. So in this case, you might go for the biggest one and then you would put it into the area of pensions. Note, this doesn't make any sense when there is already one customs officer waiting there because then it's directly been seized again. Of course, this would change if this customs officer would be bribed by you. One last action I have to explain you though is the pass action. It says keep remaining influence cubes but no further action may be taken this turn. And once all the players have passed then the round actually ends. So this means everyone gets to grab new influence cubes based on their reputation and all the motivated characters will be unmotivated so that you can use them again. It needs to be mentioned though that you can still play secret cards that says play it any time like this U boy which lets you move a customs officer instead of someone else.
There are different other possibilities in this game that you can do, like discover a secret here. So in this case, you pay two gold or two influence to grab yourself directly a secret card. You could buy reputation. You can do honest work, which I explained to you, which is a, was a little bit broken during the version one of the rules. Um, then you could move the customs officer, for example, and stuff like that. And of course, there are so many different actions that come with either the secrets cards or the character cards here. So for example, Nicholas Thomas here, he can be motivated as an action, pay two influence and receive three gold. Or Alan Cutler here, who lets you pay one influence to move one customs officer, one space and really many other different possibilities that would provided by the character cards. I think I will end my review explanation video here. Unlike in other review videos where I really dived into every little rule of this game, I think I will leave it at this point here because everything else would directly confuse you. You really have to read this, you have to experience it, and you really need at least one or two games in order to get all behind all of the mechanics and all the strategic decisions that you have to take. So really when we played the game for the first time, we we were completely lost. No one was, was really knowing what he was doing. After maybe half of the game it got clearer but then some of your decisions already have decided for you basically and you would stuck in either that direction or the other direction. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope to see you soon in one of my next playthrough or review videos and until then bye bye.